Scotty Moriarty was born in Ireland, but moved to Australia in 1966 at the age of 19. In 2005, he made his final move to the remote outback town of Larimer. Counting Paddy, Larimer had 11 residents. It sits along the Stewart Highway, some 300 miles south of Darwin. On the evening of December 16th, 2017, Paddy was where he could usually be found, the pub at the Pink Panther Hotel. He was, of course, joined by his constant companion, his red Kelpie dog, Kelly. Paddy had almost always had a dog, but Kelly was new to him, being only a year old. Paddy would habitually have eight beers a night, and sometimes more if he were having a good time. Around sundown that night, he left for home. A tourist on his way through town gave Paddy what was left of a store-bought rotisserie chicken so that he could give it to Kelly as a treat. Paddy and Kelly were never seen again. The police were called 72 hours after Paddy was last seen by Barry Sharp, the publican at the Pink Panther, who grew worried after Paddy failed to maintain his usual routine. All clues seem to indicate that Paddy made it home on the night of the 16th, but did not stay there. The date-stamped chicken wrapper from the tourist was found inside the microwave of Patty's home, across the Stewart Highway from the Pink Panther Hotel. There were no signs of struggle in the home, but police found Patty's eyeglasses and hat, which he was rarely ever seen without due to his baldness, left in the house. Patty's calendar, which was from 2016, but had 2017 dates handwritten into the boxes, showed that the last day crossed off was December 15th the day before he was last seen, as though Patty did not finish the night of the 16th at home. The remote and dangerous landscape could have played a part in Patty and Kelly going missing. Everything from sinkholes to wild boars could conceivably have played a part in the case. However, the tense social situation in the tiny town could also have been the cause of the mystery. The handful of residents in Larima had once been very close. However, over the years, Seemingly petty concerns had divided the town. A tea house owned by Fran Hodgett sold, among other things, homemade meat pies. At some point, the Pink Panther Hotel also began selling them. The competition in the small town was controversial, and Patty, a fixture at his beloved Pink Panther, was quick to tell tourists that Fran's pies were inferior. Fran, whose home and business were almost directly across the highway from Patty's home, of course did not appreciate this. Rumors eventually began spreading throughout the town about Fran's quality of ingredients, and the camaraderie between the townspeople quickly deteriorated. There were, of course, probably other issues at play in the town, but the residents of Larima have been far more reluctant to speak publicly about them. Fran has alleged that Patty did everything from trying to poison her patrons to throwing a dead kangaroo onto her property. She was reported to have said that she wanted to kill Patty, but she maintains that she only made that statement as an expression to indicate her frustration with him. Fran's gardener, who also lived on the property, Owen Laurie, has also been looked on with suspicion in Larima, but his relatively recent arrival in town may also be a cause for that. On the night Patty was last seen, Owen attempted to make two phone calls, neither of which connected, from a public phone booth outside Fran's property at approximately the time Patty would have been going by on his way home from the pub. Police say they have no indication that the calls play into Patty's disappearance. All 10 remaining residents of Larima have been interviewed by police, and all 10 have denied involvement in the disappearance of Patty and Kelly. Almost all of them were also called to give evidence at a coroner's inquest into Patty's presumed death in June 2018. The inquest was halted, despite only being partially heard. Investigators have looked at animal shelters throughout the Northern Territory, hoping that Kelly may have been dropped off at one and provide them with a lead, but have had no success. In October 2018, Barry Sharp was forced to put the Pink Panther Hotel up for auction when he was diagnosed with terminal prostate cancer and could no longer handle the work of running the establishment. Police continue to investigate Patty's case as an unsolved homicide. Christina Voltaire's life was a string of challenges that she worked hard to overcome. Born in Haiti, Christina was separated from her father at age 11 
when he was able to emigrate to the United States. She was reunited with him when she too was able to emigrate as a teenager, but this meant being away from her mother and siblings back in Haiti. Christina planned to remedy this challenge by getting an education and earning a good enough living to bring the rest of her family to the United States. At the beginning of 2011, Christina was close to completing the first part of that goal. A student in nuclear medicine at Kaiser University, Christina had completed most of the coursework she needed for her degree. She was living alone in an apartment in the Berkshire apartment complex in Winter Haven, Florida. Christina was also still coping with another hardship in her life. She was weeks away from the one year anniversary of the death of her infant daughter. The medical examiner was never able to identify a cause of death for baby Audrey. Those close to Christina say that while she had been devastated by Audrey's death, she was coping with the loss as well as could be expected. The last place Christina was publicly seen was at an IHOP at 11.30 in the morning. She had a leisurely meal and told a former co-worker who was working at the restaurant that she was feeling ill. She called to postpone a hair appointment before heading home to rest. At approximately 7 p.m. that night, Christina had a knock on her door. It was her friend and neighbor, Charles Pierre Gill. Charles' car had broken down while he was driving home. He walked back to their apartment complex to call his mechanic and wanted to borrow Christina's tan Hyundai Elantra to drive back to his disabled vehicle and look it over with his mechanic. According to Charles, Christina was still not feeling well. She was dressed in a black robe and drinking a cup of tea. She was trying to complete some studying. Christina gave Charles her set of keys and he locked the door of her apartment as he went out to get her car. He drove back to his own car where the mechanic gave him bad news about the state of his engine. Charles then drove to his mother's house to pick up two plates of food. He then drove back to his apartment complex and went to Christina's unit to return her keys. When Charles entered the apartment just 45 minutes after he had left, Christina was gone. The black robe she had been wearing was laying on her bed. There were no signs of struggle in the apartment. Christina's purse and laptop were still there. Without her car, she had no way of getting very far on her own. When Christina did not come back home, Charles called the police. Christina's relationships with both Charles and his brother, Dussel, have been areas of interest in Christina's sudden disappearance. According to Charles, he and Christina were just good friends and were never romantically involved. Christina had, however, been romantically involved with Dussel. Dussel had believed that Christina's daughter Audrey had been his daughter as well. A few months after Audrey's death, he had been trying to file an insurance claim for the costs of her funeral. To do so, he needed to provide her birth certificate. When he looked at it, he found out that Christina had listed another man as the child's father. While this might have made some men angry, Dussel claims that it only left him disappointed. Because Christina was still so upset about Audrey's death, he did not want to fight with her over not being Audrey's biological father, so he calmly ended their relationship. Christina's father, however, paints a very different picture of Christina's relationship with both of the brothers. He claims that Christina was in fact romantically involved with Charles. He further alleges that Dussel had been hostile towards Christina in recent months because of this relationship. He claims to have received a phone call at 1 a.m. a few months before Christina went missing, in which his daughter told him that Dussel had been physically aggressive towards her. Dussel had been charged with a violent offense once before, although he had been acquitted on that charge. Some of Christina's actions do seem to indicate that she feared for her physical safety. On the morning of the day she disappeared, Christina visited the management office of her apartment complex and asked to have her locks changed. A work order was put in, but the locks were not changed that day. Both Charles and Dussel claimed that they did not have keys to the apartment, although Charles did have Christina's key when he came back to drop off her car keys. Christina never spoke to anyone, including her father, about why she wanted the locks changed. According to Dussel, he had been in Fort Lauderdale, a more than three-hour drive from Winter Haven, when Christina vanished. 
He had left Winter Haven at approximately noon on January 8th to make the drive. He was in Fort Lauderdale to see his girlfriend, who had recently given birth to the couple's daughter. Dussel said in a media interview, about a month after Christina was last seen, that ATM and cell records should confirm his alibi. The quality of the surveillance tapes Winter Haven police first received from Fort Lauderdale was not high enough to identify Dussel on them. However, police did eventually receive enough evidence to corroborate Dussel's alibi. If she is still alive, Christina will turn 31 in August 2019. Michelle Jolene Lakey, who preferred to be called by her middle name, was 11 years old in 1986. She and her family lived in Scranton, Pennsylvania. Her family consisted of her mother and three older siblings. Her parents were estranged and she had not spoken to her father in three years. On August 26th, she went to visit her mother, Lois Dunham, in Mercy Hospital, a facility now called the Regional Hospital of Scranton. Since her mother was in the hospital, she planned to spend the night with a friend. Before heading to that friend's house, however, Jolene had to walk home from the hospital. The walk should have only taken 15 minutes. She was seen walking on North Washington Avenue, the street where she lived. However, she never made it to her home in its 1300 block. Jolene seemingly vanished into thin air in broad daylight. A massive effort was launched by the local community to cover Scranton in posters with Jolene's picture. The effort brought forth an unconfirmed sighting of Jolene getting into a light yellow vehicle just a block away from her home. This sighting would become relevant a few years later when police finally had a person of interest in Jolene's case. Frank Ossolani is currently serving a life sentence for the 1989 rape and murder of nine-year-old Renee Waddell. At his trial in 1990, police received a tip that Ossolani had been seen with a young girl at Lake Wallenpapuk, roughly 30 miles east of Scranton, around the time Jolene disappeared. The idea that the young girl could have been Jolene is strengthened by the fact that Jolene knew Ossolani. Jolene was known to visit the auto repair shop Ossolani owned to play with his dog. Ossolani did not own a light yellow car but his line of work gave him access to numerous vehicles at any one time. When interviewed about Jolene, Ossolani admitted knowing her, and even claimed he gave the little girl rides on occasion, but denied any involvement in her disappearance. Police have not been able to find evidence firmly connecting him to the case. Jolene's mother moved her family out of Scranton and into New York State, and ultimately Rhode Island, after Jolene went missing but she and Jolene's siblings regularly returned to Scranton in August. They walked the route Jolene took from the hospital that day and symbolically complete the walk home she was not able to finish in 1986. A kiosk displaying Jolene's full name now stands in Courthouse Square in Scranton, displaying information about other missing children in hopes that Jolene can help bring other kids home. Joan Lawrence was born in Ottawa, Ontario in 1921. As an adult, she worked as a copy editor for a Toronto newspaper and became a published poet. In the early 1960s, she moved to Huntsville in Ontario's Muskoka region. Muskoka is a popular vacation destination due to its many lakes and natural beauty. It was around this time that Joan began fostering abandoned litters of kittens. For the rest of her life, she would affectionately be referred to as the Cat Lady, on account of her love for the animals and the care she provided for them. By the mid-1990s, she had approximately 30 cats under her care. It was around this time that Joan's life became intertwined with the Land family. The Lands were outwardly a large, God-fearing Seventh-day Adventist family. Several members of the family, however, had extensive criminal records. Most of these family members were heavily involved in the family businesses started in the early 1990s. The Land family began a string of Christian retirement homes that claimed to provide a full range of care services for a reasonable price in a home-like setting. In actuality, the homes were overcrowded and in poor shape. Residents slept on mattresses on the floor and were served cheap meals of rice, pasta, or macaroni and cheese. 
not all of the homes had shower or toilet facilities. The majority of the residents of the land's homes had no family to notice and object to this kind of treatment. The lands trolled Toronto homeless shelters for new residents, telling vulnerable and lonely senior citizens that they could be cared for in the picturesque woods of cottage country in exchange for their monthly government pension check. The home Joan lived in was not technically a retirement home that claimed to provide care for its residents. Rather, it was more like an affiliated rental property for the elderly. Refusing to be separated from the cats she so loved, Joan had to live in a dilapidated shack behind the main house. The shack had no insulation, heat, running water, or electricity. For these terrible accommodations, the lands took almost $700 a month from Joan in rent. That amount was almost the entirety of Joan's monthly government check. The two members of the Land family Joan interacted with the most were David Land, her landlord, and his uncle, Vaughn Allen, who ostensibly was the handyman for the property. David would often give Joan a ride into town. On the days he didn't, she would walk the eight miles so that she could buy food for her cats and take advantage of the free coffee at a local shop. She was well known to the people in town. In October 1998, however, Joan stopped coming into town. After a few weeks, the Ontario Provincial Police were called to investigate her disappearance. Around the time she went missing, Joan had been complaining to her friends in town that she had not received her much needed income tax check. She had a friend who worked in a law office look into the matter just prior to her disappearance. The check had in fact been issued and arrived. After Joan confronted him twice, Ron Allen admitted that he had forged Joan's signature and cashed her check. Joan's bank account turned out to be a joint account shared with David Land. Joan did not have a bank card, but David Land did have one for the account. The bank card was used six times after Joan had last been seen. Ron Allen, despite seeing Joan almost every day prior to her disappearance, never reported her missing once he stopped seeing her. David Land initially told authorities that he had no idea what happened to Joan. In subsequent conversations, he gave outlander stories about Joan going into hiding from the police or being on a trip to New York or Hawaii or some other destination that Joan clearly could not afford to travel to. According to Joan's friends, she would never have abandoned her cats, even if she did have the financial means to leave the area on her own. During a search of Joan's shack in December 1998, police located the remains of several of Joan's cats. They had been shot. Joan was not the only resident of one of the land's retirement homes to go missing. John Semple, John Crafts, and Ralph Grant were all also residents in the homes who mysteriously went missing between 1998 and 1999. The lands never reported any of the men missing either. In an investigation into the three missing men's finances, it was discovered that the lands had stolen tens of thousands of dollars on their retirement benefits and committed fraud by cashing their checks after they had gone missing. Various members of the land family who worked for the retirement homes received either short conditional sentences or probation for the financial crimes. None of them ever actually spent time in prison. No one has ever been charged in relation to the men's disappearances. David Land and Ron Allen were never convicted of any crime in relation to their financial dealings with Joan or her forged tax check. Joan remains missing, but feared dead. On paper, Samuel Todd seemed like someone with a clear path in life. He came from a long line, on both sides of his family, of people who were dedicated to both religious life and social justice. His father was a Presbyterian minister and the former director for Urban Mission at the World Council of Churches. His mother had taken Sam and his three brothers to celebrate the first Earth Day and protests against the Vietnam War. Sam entered his father's alma mater, Yale Divinity School, in 1981, after an undergraduate career at Vassar, full of volunteer work concerned with bettering the lives of those in the inner city and in third world countries, the same concentration his father's interests had. In actuality, Sam's life was somewhat chaotic. 
His father's career and his own desire to help others had led him to live in Asia, Europe, Africa, and all over the United States. According to one of his former roommates, he never even bothered to unpack when he moved into their dorm room, seeming to always be prepared for his inevitable next move. When he entered Yale Divinity, his plan was to pursue an academic degree, rather than a ministerial one like his father before him, and eventually become a professor of religious studies. By his final year at Yale, however, he seemed to have turned to the pastoral path taken by his father and grandfather. In the fall of 1983, he passed the first set of the Presbyterian Church's ordination exams. His academic performance in his Yale classes were far more spotty, however, and it was not certain that he would graduate in the spring of 1984 as scheduled. Sam had an aunt who was willing to help cover the costs of his education, but he did not always take advantage of this. Sam largely struggled to cover his bills from Yale and his rent payments with the funds from his part-time, $4-an-hour job. With all these struggles and internal conflicts, it is understandable that Sam decided to blow off some steam by having a festive New Year's Eve. He was scheduled to leave for a religious conference with his parents on January 1st, 1984. He decided to spend New Year's Eve in New York City with his brother Adam. Adam, Sam, and their group of friends spent the evening party hopping in Lower Manhattan. They ended up at a party at 271 Mulberry Street. By 1.30 a.m. on January 1st, Sam, who had been drinking both beer and vodka, was visibly drunk and unstable. Adam suggested that the two of them go outside to sober up in the frigid January air, so Sam stumbled downstairs with him. Sam, still not feeling better, told his brother that he was going to run around the block. Adam watched his brother jog towards Houston Street. He would be the last person to see Sam. Adam was uneasy about leaving Sam alone outside almost as soon as he came back inside. When Sam did not return to the party after a few minutes, Adam began a search that would escalate throughout the next hours and days. Adam and a group of friends began searching the streets and nearby parties. At 4.30 a.m., Adam called his oldest brother, John, who drove in from New Jersey and helped Adam search hospitals. At 11 a.m., they went to the police to file New York City's first missing persons report of 1984. The volunteer search for Sam was massive. Its headquarters were set up in a Greenwich Village church and headed by Sam's brother. More than 20,000 flyers were plastered all over New York by friends of Sam, who came from all over the country to aid in the search. By the end of January, over half of Yale Divinity School's 400 students had volunteered for the cause in one capacity or another. The initial concern following Sam's disappearance was that he could have been involved in some sort of accident. He had been intoxicated and could have fallen and injured himself. New York had been filled with partygoers on the night he went missing, and many of them had been drinking as well. Another intoxicated person could have hit him with a car or started a fight with him that ended in his death. Sam was never brought to a hospital, and his body was never found, leaving these theories unproven. Another popular theory was that Sam decided to leave his life behind and go live amongst the homeless people he had spent so much of his life trying to help. Volunteers searched homeless shelters and soup kitchens for him, but never found him there. While theories in Sam's case abound, Solid answers still remain scarce, and Sam has never been located.